Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. Today, my friend Terry Hershey and I talk about his book, Soul Gardening, which after having written 16 books, this is one of his very favorites. And I have a feeling it's one of his favorites because it just might be a faithful autobiography of a man in search of himself and what it means to embrace a life on planet Earth. The closing work, words of his book tell it all. People who love this world, who pay attention, are all gardeners. Because gardening is not just about digging or planting. Gardening is about cherishing. Delightful words. Let's bring on Terry to tell us more. Yo, Hirsch. Charles. What's up, amigo? That was good. That was good. You know how you can tell you, yeah, yeah, that was good. You know how you can tell you're an insecure human being. <laughs> I know a lot of ways. <laughs> tell me one of yours. <laughs> when when people introduce me and tell me how many books I've written, and then I have to correct them. Oh, I thought it was That's sixteen. You know what English. what is it? Eighteen. Oh well, holy! Oh, so actually. So. I, Actually, no, I have a different answer. The answer is, how many books have I written? I've written 32. I've published 18. <laughs> well, you know, I think that's a pretty amazing record. I think 18 published. There, You know, you're in, you're in rarefied air to have uh, 18 published books. Um, well, no. Actually, the rarefied air is, is not the number you publish. It's the number you publish that are of value. And I will, I will admit that of my 18, um, 16 of them are of value. Yes, yeah, and I'm glad you put it that way. It's not of, you know, I was expecting you to say the number that sell. And good books, typically, I mean, really good books, literary books, are not, you know, are, are not number one bestsellers. They are not. Oh, no, there's a staggering... Uh, number of great stories about books that are extraordinary and did not sell. Yeah, we could we could yeah, name I mean, a handful my, right now. We, yeah, correct, yeah. So Gardening is the the best book I've ever written because it's the most uh, personal. Yeah, it's the most autobiographical. Tell a lot of personal stories and and you are um, as personal as you like to get, you really are a keep your your private self, very private. And um, mm -hmm. you, you sort of opened up yourself to a degree, to a degree. <laughs> but it was, it was to an to a abnormal degree for you. So you know what I want to do today, Terry, is I want to begin, begin this show on your book at the end of your book. You, you close the book, Soul Gardening, with a brief paragraph that I referred to in the opening. And... Um, if you wouldn't mind, I would like you to read that entire paragraph. Do you know which one it is? It's on page 159. Mm-hmm. Read that paragraph for us. Yeah, I'll actually start in the paragraph before. Okay. Gardeners are an odd lot. We are isolated by our own particular tastes, from primroses to antique roses, from austere to to gluttonous, from sedums to cedars, from cauliflower to sunflower, from jacaranda to jackman's blue, from New York to California, from a single clay pot to acreage as far as the eye can see. We live in our own worlds, fueled by dreams and imagination and fancy, and yet we are linked to gardeners past and present sharing a common gusto for this experiment we call life, and this planet we call home. People who love this world, people who pay attention, are gardeners. People who are invested, people who are aware, they are gardeners regardless of whether or not they've ever picked up a trowel, because gardening is not just about digging, 
or planting for that matter. Gardening is about cherishing. It's beautiful. Now, now tell me what you meant. I moved to Vashon Island up in the Pacific Northwest 32 years ago, a little over, from a place called Orange County, California. From Woodbridge, which is... As... Yeah, in or Irvine, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of the, um, one of the little stories I, I, I tell is the little boy that said to his mama, 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 listen to me, but this time with your eyes. The story is simply, am I present here in this moment? Am I present? And one of the things that happened to me in my move is that um, I found a place that invited me to be present, which meant to be, to see, to hear, to taste, to touch. It meant to feel in the moment. It meant to give there. It meant to bring my whole self and whole heart there. And the garden did that. And there's several ways to describe garden as we can get into, but for the first time, I understood that story. It wasn't a technique, listen with your eyes. It was putting yourself in a place where your whole heart was there. And gardening did it. it, it it's sort of sans distraction that you have to, you have to, um, you, you, you know, it's almost like, I, I understand it, not a, a conscious detachment from distraction, but you are so attracted to what you're doing that the distractions no longer pay heed in your life. Single one of us remembers this, Charlie, from the time when we were three years old. We were there. We were completely in the moment, regardless of what it was. Well, there was no. And there was nothing else. Ex but yeah, but distraction didn't really wasn't an issue. Right. Right. I mean. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the last one of your guests who's going to get overly religious. But it's amazing to me that, I mean, the, the whole the, the the Jesus thing about you have if you want to be in the kingdom, you have to be a kid. You have to be a child. And that that that's what we're talking about. Listen, this time with your eyes. In other words, be here and now. For the first time, I was invited to be here now. And I was invited through gardening, yeah, through gardening. which oddly and, enough and, began in Irvine in that small little village called Woodbridge. That was the beginning. See, but of this the is what's interesting was, about the gardening there is that what's interesting. Um, so let me tell you a story. So because you know I I I've designed gardens for thirty some odd years to, for people, right? Right. And w when I go to the house and they they want to they're thinking through what they want design. You know this. I've done your garden, right? Yes. But when I go to when I go to most couples' house, they show me magazines with these extraordinary photos, and they say, "Can you do that?" And I say to them, "Of course I can. With the right amount of money, I can do anything." <laughs> and I say, but but so but much of it that problem. depends on on on. If I'm interrupting, tell me. But it, but it well, I am. But it 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 so much is on instant gratification. I want my house to look now like that garden that that if done well has taken a Which decade or two yeah, to, that's, to grow. That's exactly what I say to them. I say, I, of course I can do that. But here's the problem: it won't be your garden. It'll be a landscape, and a landscape is for is for. Um, Drive-by viewing. That's all a lands. A landscape is for public opinion. That's all a landscape is for. What do people think when they drive by? But isn't that part of the, the process, garden. Terry? Is isn't that part of the process of gardening that we begin? I remember my love for gardening began, you know, of all places, perhaps in Palm Springs, with impatience and all of this, you know, this Disneyland, very choreographed look about it, but it was still spectacular, and then I matured in my gardening to where 
those annual flowers mean nothing to me. And I like bushes, I like roses, I like flowers, but it's largely the, the placement of, of bushes and different colors, and, and that wouldn't have attracted me then. There is, a, there is a, sort of a maturity in gardening, is there not? Yeah, well, the maturity is not about necessarily about what you like, because what you like is, you know, runs the gamut. You can do the the annuals that are colorful, which is fine. You can do the shrubs. That's fine. That's your that's, that's what you prefer. But am am I at home here? Is the question. That's that's the question. I think, and I Does think that's a question. Me? Does, does it invite me to stop? Does it invite me to pay attention? Does it invite me to notice? Does it not? Does it invite me to be grateful? Does it invite me to wonder and surprise and awe? If it invites me to all those, then you're in a good garden. You, if people say to me, "How do you know a great garden?" and they they expect me to, to describe what's in it, no. You want to know a great garden? You sneak up on the gardener and you find that they have a smile on their face, you're in a great garden. And dirt in their fingernails. Exactly. You're in a great garden. They're, they're thrilled to be there. In other words, they're thrilled to be there. The point is, they're thrilled to be there now. That's a great garden. I'm thrilled to be alive in this moment. That's a great garden. You, you know what I want to do in this show? Uh, it sounds like we're talking about gardens, and I really, the movement of the show, it's not so much about gardens as it is, I'd like to talk about the art of life through the lens of a gardener. I'd, I would like to talk about our individual lives, how our, our lives, our spirituality, our innermost self, what is important to us, is revealed through the life and activities of a gardener. Is that okay with you? Yeah, and that, that's the quote you're at the very beginning. I mean, yes. anybody who's in love with this world, this moment, this time now, is a gardener. So you wrote... I did a walk today. I don't... I, I Charlie, I just moved from... A, I had a five-acre garden, five mm -hmm. acres of a garden, five acres. I don't have that now. I have n no acres at all. I live in a condominium, but I walk. I walk every day for three miles. And I, I, I walk by a couple things a day, and I have to stop and take pictures because I think that's extraordinary to me. And that reminds me of what it means to be a gardener. In other words, alive. I notice. I pay attention. I'm isn't, here. Isn't that something in your book about walking, about Native Americans and walking and blessing? Do you recall that part in your book? No, but it sounds great. Yeah, it was about it's about a Native American <laughs> who, as he's walking, he says, I have just walked blessed ground, and as I proceed, I'm about to walk blessed ground. And Oh yeah, that's a that's a great uh, that's a great Native American thing. Yeah, and yeah. and he is pursuing. It is blessed where I walk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he is he is pursuing a blessed life by observing. Now, one of the things that, that you wrote that I, I would like to I'd like you to talk about because I think this is important and and it's in our American pursuit of attaining a what I'm calling a productive yet chaotic self regard. And you write, life mm -hmm. is not about being somebody. Is it about it's about being or sitting still with this somebody that you already are? That's mm. that's a huge that's a huge statement because we live our lives trying to be somebody when you are suggesting we already are somebody if we pay attention to it. Yeah, uh, when I when I give, uh, uh, I say when I give. When I used to give uh, talks, uh, I to garden clubs, you know, different garden clubs in different places in different states. I I'd say to them, and these are people who are gardeners, right? Quote, 
But I say to them, you know how you're, do you know how you're in the presence of a true gardener when you're at their house, their place? The first words out of their mouth are, I'm sorry. You should have been here last week. It was so amazing last week. Or next week would be extraordinary, which is to your point. I find that sad. If I, huh? I find that sad. I know, but the point is, it, you, it's bought into the whole thing that I have to impress somebody or prove something. In other words, the whole thing about my garden is not about me simply being here. In other words, it's about me having to do something so somebody will like it, which is your point about our cultural pressure about who we're supposed to be. Yeah, it's like, it's like you know, I'm going to quote you a lot because I... I, I I underlined quite a bit in the book, and so you, you you write about the twin pillars of worth, and I think this really fits in here. And the twin pillars of worth are busyness and accomplishments, and that is that is what we seek. You know, in Richard Rohr's first half of life, that is what we seek. That's what you sought as the preacher extraordinaire and the personality extraordinaire. That's what I thought in my in my church life, my business life. And I found with these twin pillars of of worth, which you called busyness and, and accomplishments, after I retired, I personally experienced both of those becoming twin pillars of self-loathing because I didn't have busyness, I had boredom. I didn't have accomplishments, I had uselessness. Therefore, I was almost non-existent. Yeah, and... and- and to that point, which is so extraordinary, is because we've, we've, uh, uh, what, what, what have we done? We've linked ourselves or connected ourselves to those measurements. Uh, Abram Heschel, Abram, Ab, Ab, Rabbi Abram Heschel said that we don't teach our children awe and wonder. We teach them how to weigh and measure. That's those two things. And if my spirit is about weighing and measuring, then when I get to a place where weighing, weighing and measuring doesn't matter anymore, retirement, whatever, then I, who am I? And it is what a struggle for people in retirement. It's a, it's a big struggle yeah. for people in retirement. It reminds me, it reminds me of the story that you tell of um, the people at a, at a national park and they take the adults on this tour and have the adults just gaze at briefly at ever so stunning places. And they take children to one place and ask them, what do you see? What is it all about? What do you feel? And, and it should be, it should be the other way around because the, the guardians don't ask adults, how does this make you feel? What do, what do you, mm-hmm. what does this mean to you? Because that's not measurement. Yeah, that's a good, me- yeah, that's a good memory, uh, Charles, because that, that's actually Joshua Tree National Park. That was back when we took our son, Zach, when he was just a, I mean, he was probably three or four. And that's what the, that's the, the handout they give kids to go into the park. You know, I, 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 have, I have so many places I want to go, so I, I just want you to expand on whatever you want to, because I... I am I'm filled with questions and and uh, I don't know if this is the right place for this question, but I think this is really important because it, it, it does fit into this into this accomplishment and and what was the other one now? Accomplishment and busyness. And those are really important. I, I, re- I remember the days when you know you wrote about daytimers, well those were a long time ago, but we had, our self worth was identified by how filled our biz, our daytimer was. If you know, we dare not say, you know, I can meet on Thursday because I have a completely open day. You know, you you would not let anybody know you had an open day because if you had an open day, that means somehow your value was in question. I wonder, do you think that is still true today? Do you think? Do you think? Kids are thinking that. You think millennials are thinking that, or is that sort of a baby boomer? 
mindset? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's still true. I mean, I know that people still say to me, who email me, you know, people who read my blog, Sabbath Moment, and they email me. And, and, and they'll inadvertently add, I know you're busy, so you, you don't need to answer this. And that puzzles me. Because I love reading what they've written, so I'm curious where that is, and I understand it, though, too. Do you respond? I, I don't, I, you know what, I don't take the bait about the busyness part. I simply respond. But you do respond in to other your words, emails. Of course. I mean, the whole, whole point is, you wrote to me, I'm going to write to you. But it's interesting that, just to, to the to point of your question, is people, we, we inadvertently buy into that, and we don't ask something of someone connected to us because of those measurements about what is what is of value we you, you know and and we we are we are so ill taught in the matter um i have i have sort of i you know i don't want to call it bastardized uh robert Farrah capon's statement but i have a different way of stating it that i i think is so true about life and he says we are like ill taught piano students more concerned with making mistakes than making music. And Yep. The flub the flub that will get us in Dutch, he said. Right. Exactly. I, I just put mine it's in. It's about any, the right notes. Put mine in here. Yeah, I know, it's about the right notes. It's about the right notes. And as long as I'm there, I miss it. See that's the thing about the garden which is extraordinary to me. Is if I am out there and I'm glad to be alive what I've planted is not significant or important. Who I've impressed with it is not, does not matter. It's not an issue. In other words, I've gone to the music from the notes. The thing about the garden that for me is the, that, that was the first gift to me is I, I, I laid under a, an old, an old, very old cherry tree on a house I was going to buy in Vashon Island the first time, and I thought, I'm simply glad to be here. I don't know what this tree is called. Literally then, I didn't. I don't know what this tree is called. I don't know what these plants are around me. I simply am glad to be here. I can breathe. I have space. What do you think ever got you there, Terry? Because, you know, I think, I think a lot of us have trouble, as I did with the busyness and usefulness that I don't even have the space within me to analyze that deeply, to be able to say, well, back I'm in, glad yeah, to Back be in the here. day, you're, 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 <laughs> yeah, back in the day. Um, back to the Abram Heschel quote about weighing and measuring. In other words, you had a, you had a little check, check off sheet about what was weighing and measuring about what made a life valuable. In other words, whether it was productive, meaningful, and made a difference. And so you're asking what, and instead of, instead of simply living your life, instead of simply doing that, you're, you're looking over your shoulder asking, how is it that I've made a difference? And which means that you are spending all of your energy focused on what someone thinks about it. And you know, and you know the terrible thing about that? Is it's forgotten within a day or a week? That so yeah. Nowadays, within hours. Yeah, it, and, it, and it, you're and what what difference did it make? It was worthless. You 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 know one of the things that that I I took note to and I and I wrote my own notes and 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 as we're talking about. Back to your people that say, can you build a garden like this from a magazine? And it's sort of this instant gratification. What I think we learn from gardening, because even though I, like you now, have a very small spot and can't do much gardening, and I, and I too loved to garden, not to the degree that you did, but, but I, I did spend 
you know, several hours a week in my garden. And I and I'm calling it the spirituality of waiting that you cannot be a good gardener and I am discovering in my spiritual life now I cannot be a good person my innermost person without the gift of waiting and 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 that instant gratification has instant dismissal and the art of waiting you're there's something happening all along all along it's slowly it's it's happening slowly you know you quote toad and frog in 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 that same situation but you write that we north americans are not good at waiting for the soul we are not good about waiting for anything for that matter and then you tell this story about africa and waiting i i thought that that may apply here do you think that applies the safari in Africa. Uh, well, tell me the story. Oh, you want me to tell you the story in my version? Mm -hmm. Or just remind you of what it is? Yeah, I've forgotten. Oh, it's the one where the the safari master leader, the, the white man from Europe, is bound and determined to make headway daily and he's just oh right 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 yeah on the first day yeah because he he had stuff he had to carry all his stuff because that's what makes us uh, he was North American of course that's what makes us North Americans we have stuff we have stuff yeah stuff uh, yeah that's the old George Carlin thing we have stuff uh, stuff is what makes us who we are. Um, yeah, and so he, he hired people to carry all his stuff. And on the first day, they got up very, very early and traveled very, very fast, went very, very far. Second day, they got up very, very early and traveled very, very fast, went very, very far. Third day, they got up very, very early and traveled very, very fast, went very, very far. And on the fourth day, he got up. And the tribes people who he had hired to carry his stuff refused to move, and the Translator said they're waiting for their souls to catch up with their bodies. It's an extraordinary thing about gardening that, that I mean, that's the whole thing about downtime and dormancy, is the gift of waiting. You know, I, I had a thing that I wanted to close with, but I think it's important to talk about it now. And then we'll take a break after we do this. I want to focus on my favorite section of the book, which, you know, you said I'm not from Seattle or Washington because my, my favorite section is winter. Uh, and that and winter is the spirit of waiting because it appears to spring and summer and even autumn people that winter is just a time of death, but it's not a time of death. It's a time of preparation for rebirth. And and just a few years ago, I have a vivid recollect, recollection of sitting in what was odd. It was a viewing, a viewing lounge in a museum just north of Copenhagen, Denmark. And it was on the coast. And, and it was a room. There were, there were no books. There was, you know, they weren't, I think you could take in a cup of coffee, but it wasn't a restaurant. It just had surrounded by windows, and you could view the outside uh, terrain. And it was right on the coast. And I was stunned by the beauty of the barren trees lining the coast. There was something just absolutely, again, stunning, gorgeous about these barren trees. And and it led me to write the opening words of an essay that. Winter in Scandinavia is underrated. I think the season of winter is underrated. Can do do you, do you think that, or do you just see work? I had mute on, one hundred percent. And I, you, you know, I do I do I do a trip annually with a friend. We do wine tasting, but we always go in the winter in Europe. So we're in 
England or we're in France or we're in Spain or wherever, but it's, it's winter. And every time we go, I go to the gardens in those cities. And he says, what in the heck? What's remarkable about a winter garden is that at its core is what the garden is. That's where its bones are, right? That's the bones of the garden. I'm going to read one thing, and it, it, I know you're going to do your break, but I just... No, 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 no hurry, no hurry. I, I opened my, my book to this because... This is something that happened to me. Someone talked about garden, and they said, uh, I don't understand the winter garden thing. I don't get it. They were from a place that didn't have winter, quote. And they said, but the problem with your garden is there's not much to see here, is there? And I answered, true. But I guess that all depends on what you're looking for. Right. But if you look up, you will see the filigree canopy created by our 150-foot cedar tree. Off to the side, you'll notice the mottled rust bark of our native madrone tree, revealing like a shedding skin a trunk with a polished gleam of a cinnamon swizzle stick. Or you'll admire the dark, rich green of our native yew, covered with red-hot red tinged berries, resembling miniature pitted olives. Or be amazed by the fronds of licorice fern, a pendant from the trunks of a big leaf maple tree and woodland rock. And I go on. And then I say, so there's not much to see here, is there? It does all depend on what you're looking for. It is that that instant gratification. It is that it is that that instant orgasmic sort of feel rather than the if I want to put it in sexual terms, the rather than the the slow and endearing um um intimacy that is involved. I have. I was thinking about something, and it just eluded me. I was thinking of waiting and the importance of waiting. And I'm, and in the last, you know, my my journey of the last fourteen or fifteen months, one of the things that I have really learned is waiting, and not to hurry and and to say I don't have to have the answer today. I just have to trust that the answer will come in time. And it's like gardening, is it not? When I'm planting the seeds, I don't have to wait for, you know, the spectacular roses to, well, the roses are never seeds, but I don't have to wait for the spectacular part of the garden to bloom. I can enjoy the process of it, of it growing into bloom and growing in its way, in its own way. And and I and I and I just think of the of the correlation to my life. It's the slow growing, and I'm feeling the slow growing, even at my age. I'm feeling the slow growing of maturity and and deeper intimacy with the divine. And but it but it is slow. It it is. I can't. Every time I try to hurry, I screw it up. Um. I, I I just think there's something about waiting and 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 being slow and being patient that is so critical and so almost non-existent in our culture. Yeah, it's the permission. It's the permission to see the process too, because what's amazing about we're talking about gardening, but it's just nature. I mean, just watching what happens with nature over seasons and growth and growing and dying and new growth what we've done in this culture when when you when you do weighing and measuring back to abram heschel it's about performance it's all about the quote bloom which is fascinating because there's so much about what's going on that is that bloom is just a short period of time and there's so much that's happening that's so remarkable the, the way Things grow and die and live, and the color, just the way it, the way it is. It's um, the gift of it all is remarkable. 
you know, you write about May Sarton, you know, a, a, a famous gardener and, and poet and essayist. And you write that May Sarton warned that gardening is not for the young because the young are too impatient and too self-absorbed. That's it. That's a great, that's a great quote. They can't handle death. <laughs> yeah, that they can't handle death. They can't handle death. They I, can't handle death. But I like that I mean, impatient and self-absorbed as well as death, in that that we are yeah. impatient and we want it now. So let's let's take a break and we'll we'll come back to um, to the second half of the show. This is Charlie Hedges, and now this is Charlie Hedges, and you're listening to The Next Chapter with Charlie, and I'm with my good friend Terry, and we're talking about his um, really delightful and and quite enlightening uh, book, Soul Gardening. calls it The Cultivating of Life, but I, but I call it um, Seeing the Art of Life Through the Lens of a Gardener, and we have talked about several subjects, and today or not today, at, at this time, I want to talk about some of Terry's pathology that growing up in a very in a very organized and restrictive sort of culture, and he writes a lot in the book, especially in the first half of the book, about keeping our lives tidy, and that he devoted so much time and, and attention to that, and and he now calls that a very uncomfortable place to live, And he says, you may go as far as to say, tidiness is a disease, or may I put it a a Um, dis-ease. My first question, Terry, if if tidiness is a disease, does that give me permission to keep a messy office? (laughs) It's up to you, buddy. (laughs) Uh, <laughs> Messy is in the eye of the beholder. That's you, you know, you know. I have this office, and and I will clean it up every quarter to six months, and it will be just immaculate. And and really, really, it's not longer than a week, and it's a mess again. So I've just given up. I file by pile. Which one? Which one feels good to you? Both. I like I like it when it's clean. It feels you know my mind feels clean, but. But my life works on filing by piling and and just having the stuff around me. You know, that's just that's sort of who I'm. Yeah, but that's the ongoing process of how you live your life. And as long as you're comfortable with both parts of that, then you're good. As long as you don't disassociate yourself from one of those, then you're good. So, what is it about keeping our lives tidy that tidiness is a disease? Well, it's the same with the people who say, when you go to their garden, and they say, I'm sorry. In other words, they assume their garden has to look a specific way. So it's not tidiness per se. It's that the assumption that it has to be a certain way. In other words, it has to look like the magazine. So it's not about them. Words, it's about it, pleasing other people. Exactly. It has nothing to do with, with what they're glad with or happy with or what makes them glad to be alive. How did you feel when your garden was sloppy and guests came to see it? Oh, it was a great story about that because I, I, uh, the, the, well, I had a few gardens on Vashon, but the last one I had before I moved four months ago, I had for 20 years. And, and it was a pretty extraordinary garden, if I do say so myself. And, um, and people would come to visit, right? And I'd tour them. Well, there's a place in my garden you've been to my garden there's a pond in back and there's a pond and a river that runs the pond and the waterfall well that wasn't there at the beginning because it takes time to build it and like uh, uh, (laughs) cobbler's children they don't get their shoes right away right so it takes a while for a gardener who's designing to put in all the stuff well that wasn't there and so when people came to visit my garden all that was there was a mud pit, quite large, 
25, 30 feet across in a long stream, but a mud pit because it wasn't done yet. But I would make sure that people didn't see it because I didn't want to be embarrassed and because I'd have to explain why it wasn't the way it should be. Why it was incomplete. Yeah. Well, the thing about being a mud pit is that it's you're not you're not dealing with it, you're not worrying about it, and so whatever grows there grows there. Zachary, my son, back in the day, he was young, he loved the mud pit, but whatever grows there grows there, which meant whatever what grow what what was growing there was dandelions. Just in the well, mud pit, they didn't, didn't they didn't go out in the mud pit in the, in the, in the whole pond because the rest beyond that was lawn and whatever and stuff that I was worried about. In other words, that's the whole point. Stuff I was worried about taking care of for public opinion. This is interesting. And so on one of these little groups that was making a tour, they one woman, she didn't know she was not supposed to go over there, so she went over to the mud pit. And, and so I had to go over to explain to her, you know, it's not going to always look this way. Don't worry, et cetera. And, you know, you're not playing by the rules. And I look and see what she sees, and the whole mud pit, the whole pond, which is now a pond, was covered with dandelions, literally golden dandelions. And the river had dandelions. Like like someone had taken a vat of gold paint, you know, and poured it down this river. Had to be beautiful. And well, this is what this this woman she said this young woman she says to me, this is amazing. This is the most beautiful garden I, design I have ever seen in my life. And she said, "Whatever made you think to do this?" And I said, <laughs> "It just came to me one day. <laughs> I, I I woke up and there it was." <laughs> <laughs> Whatever and, made but, you think to build whole, a, a pond and a river? Yeah, the whole point is lions. the whole point is she. That was a turning point for me. She saw something. In other words, your your question about creating a garden just simply for public opinion. I've missed the point. And that was and that was your story that that you wrote quite frequently of um, L J. Was it L R. It, it appeared from what you wrote that he that he he gardened specifically for himself. One hundred percent. Yeah, I mean that's that one hundred percent as it should be, because it should be a reflection of who you are. Now let, let's Why? let's because apply you're... that let's apply that to life, Terry, because we are we live our lives according to what other people think it should be, so many of us do, when we really should be living it according to what, as you say, comfortable in your own skin, who you were created to be, what what pleases you. And and it is so difficult when we live in a culture of of external standards that are dictating to us that we that have become that have become feeling they they feel like they're of ourselves they feel you know the these outer pressures feel like they are internal but they are in conflict with our internal selves i you know that makes perfect sense to me but that may sound confusing to some people yeah it's not just it's not just what is it's not just doing what is quote pleasing to me but i mean uh, it's it's, what are the choices I make that make me not just glad to be alive, which is a big thing, but present? In other words, if I'm, if I'm glad to be alive and present, then I bring my whole self and my whole heart to this moment, which means I'm, I'm available now to you in a way that I could have never been. Because prior to that, if I didn't bring my whole self and whole heart to this moment, I bring the self that has to ask, who should I be? What do they need to me to be? Who am I supposed to impress? What am I supposed to do? And so I'm not even present for you. That is where you write. You know, I know you have this love-hate relationship with the notion of passion. 
and and it's such a popular subject today and but you wrote something about passion that I have never heard and and I would like you to elaborate. You said passion is not something you do now that right there contradicts most of what is taught on passion that you do your passion and that you pursue your passion but you say you suggest passion is not something you do it is something that is done to you that's a very different ideal yeah because it's it's receiving the gift of the grace of enough that is already inside you if it's something I do, then passion is a race or a contest or a beauty passion. And that's not the case. Passion is coming face to face with the gift of what is alive and well inside of you, embracing it. That's passion. And passion can, can grow, can, can sort of Diminish and grow. I have discovered with me that passion can grow, diminish, and grow in another area to where I end up with a plethora of passions, but I'm not passionate about all of them any longer as far as doing them. I still love them. You know, like, like painting for me. I was very passionate about painting, but that time ended. You know, I was very passionate about, passionate about coaching baseball. That passion ended. Now I'm passionate about writing. Um, uh, and, and that's sort of always been, I have a feeling I'll be passionate about that, but I'm passionate about my, my life, my, my inner life with the divine. That is something. And, and I don't, I don't see any, an end to that, but it, but it's a new passion. My, my passionate about painting. I still love go to loving going to museums. You know, I still love going to baseball games, but I what I am going to participate my time in has to do with other passions. Do you think passions move like that? Yeah, and here's the irony, Charles. None of them are... That, 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 it's all the same, because every single one of them is a place where you brought your whole self. That's what makes it a passion. So it's not like one ends. You bring your whole self. In other words, you bring the real chart. That's the passion. So it's not like one is over. It's just that this is where I bring the whole Charlie. One doesn't end. You know, Terry, I think that's a good way to wrap up. I like that, that soul gardening is that to which we bring our whole self. 100%. And, 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 and you don't have to stop and weigh and measure. You know, uh, you, 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 you are, the first response is unbelievable gratitude. And I would add an, an unbelievable, albeit it, it could be, it could be, diminutive but it but is still it is a sense of awe it is a sense of wonder that there is there's something special going on about this 100 percent. well terry hershey um put this on your put this on your 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 sabbath moment as a as a push on your book that this is such a wonderful book um, and um, I want to thank you for taking me and our listeners through the idea of soul gardening, which is which is I think I've subtitled it. I don't know if it'll last at this, but I've subtitled it "Cherishing and Nourishing Your Innermost Self." And and we oh, I like that. That's that's good. That's good. And and we will continue to talk about that. At this time, you know, let me let me thank all our listeners for tuning in. We are so grateful for your um, your your dedication to our work, and um, I always want to ask you to to check out our website at thenextchapter.life, dot l i f e. And as always, until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.